This video is a recording of a panel from the event Story Crafting Sessions Fantasy, a free one-day virtual conference hosted by the Weeknight Writers Group in partnership with Renaissance Press. To learn more about the Weeknight Writers Group, you can go to businessforauthors.com slash weeknight dash writers. And to learn more about Renaissance Press, you can go to pressesrenaissancepress.ca. Hi, my name is Bethany Baptiste and I'll be your moderator today. Let me get up my um, PowerPoint. And make sure that everyone can see it. Give me a thumbs up if you can see it, please. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that double thumbs up. <laughs> okay. All right. So today, um, this is the panel for Urban Fantasy, Layering Another World Over Our Own. Um, you signed up for this panel because we are going to be going over techniques and tips to balancing world building and realism in your urban fantasy novel. So first things first, um, we are going to better work or I'm going to fight you computer. Okay, thank you. Um, so first things first, we're going, I'm going to um, introduce um, each um, panelist, um, I'm going to call your name and you're just going to say a little bit about it yourself and then we're going to dive right into it. So my, as I said before, my name is Bethany Baptiste. I am a urban fantasy author um, that writes kid lit and adult. Um, so moving right along, Matu. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, hi, I'm, I'm Matu. I'm a uh traditionally published author and uh, I write horror thrillers and uh, dark urban fantasy, usually in the young adult area, but also in adult. Thank you. Next we have Lex. Hi all, I'm Lex. I also write horror, um, mostly adult, um, but some kind of coming of age sort of stuff. So it kind of is all in the mix. Um, I also run Write and Wine, which is an organization dedicated to providing uh, mental health support and community support for writers. Love that. And next we have Kay. Hey all, I'm Kay Wiggins. I, uh, I'm actually just relaunching a completed YA uh, urban fantasy series. So that hit five years uh, since the first book came out on June 1st, so fun little anniversary. And um, I write dark speculative fiction for there's a middle grade coming, YA, and then also for adult, so far mostly short fiction. So uh, definitely not good at coloring inside the lines, lots of horror, a little bit of sci-fi mixed in with the fantasy. Uh, so if you like that, check it out. We love multitasking. <laughs> Thank you. Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia Beaumont, and I also do not color inside the lines, except with a very large black Sharpie, which I just scribbled them out. <laughs> um, I write for Upper YA and Adult, and I span a whole bunch of time periods, but it's always fantasy. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. So before we get started, I would just like to say um, thank you to our sponsor, Renaissance Press, for sponsoring um, the conference and providing live captions. Also in the chat, um, Diana has left links to everyone's um, social media accounts and a link to the Ko-Fi um the ko-fi for uh weekend writers because they are raising money for um different programs so be sure to check those links out and let's get started okay so for those of you that don't know what urban fantasy is just in case because we don't need anybody acting brand new urban fantasy is a subgenre in which the real world and fantastical elements coexist or collide in a urban setting, i.e. a city, not a farm, not the suburbs, a city. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I don't. 
Okay, so the first dis discussion question is, what do you consider the most difficult part of your world building process when writing urban fantasy? And the first person we are going to be asking this question to is Kay. I was worried you were going to say that. I'm like, what is the most difficult part? I don't know. <laughs> um, I really like urban fantasy for that reason, because I don't have to work as hard in constructing something completely new, as in your high fantasies or second world fantasies. And I don't have to like get that really well-reflected realism where people are going to be like, I know that place. It's not like that. You got it wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, hmm. sometimes... You know, this is probably actually the best answer is I don't always know what city, what location I'm writing in until I get partway down the path and go like, holy crap, I did not realize how it was, was what was going on. And uh, I came to my first series from writing, from um, working in kind of this business district and these towers and going up and down the stairs. And uh, it took me a while to figure out that I was writing sort of an alternate reality version of my drudgery in corporate, you know, Canada in my case, uh, into it. So probably uh, realizing what it is that I'm writing is, is the hardest part. The rest of it comes fairly naturally. That makes a lot of sense. I know for some people, the, the city itself is a character. And then sometimes you kind of have to find who, what the, what the city is, what the location is. Sophia, you're in there. Oh, you're, oh, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Matu? Uh, yeah, so I write a lot of urban fantasy. Uh, mine's a lot darker than most urban fantasy that I've read um, in the fantasy like genre in general. Um, for me, it's so uh, I am a person who comes from kind of a more torrid background and um, some lived experiences. And uh, when I'm writing about cities, I'm not writing about your Starbucks down the corner. I'm not writing about the Marriott. I'm writing about the back alleys and what's underground, what's going on in the sewers, what's going on in the subways and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not interested in your uh, Christian Greys of the city. I'm interested in the no name who got stabbed by a drug dealer and um, what what happens when you're drug addicts and you're homeless and your society's so claimed losers are the ones with magic and shit and so for me that's what's important and um so a lot of my characters tend to have that kind of more darker background um, to make it more palatable. Uh, one, of the, one of the books that I wrote, uh, the main character just comes from Minnesota and he's just a small town kid and he's going to college in a city, but the people that he meet are not your small town individuals. They might all be going to the same college as him, but you have characters who are addicted to things like blood magic and it works like a drug and stuff like that. And I feel like um, a lot of times when I'm reading urban fantasy are our, our rough and tumble and people have zero in common with actual real people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the biggest, most difficult part of the process is making the characters feel like actual cities, like, like they're in actual urban settings and not just these wholesome characters that I've plopped in in a leather jacket and said, here you go. Uh, <laughs> because I feel like a lot of times that's what it is. And um, I find that really boring. And I'm sick of the uh, 17th century vampire who, uh, comes from wealthy noble upbringings I just I, I want the guy who shouldn't have been bit and uh, he's still trying to sell you know w uh, marijuana on the corner because it, he gotta make sure his little sister eats and shit that's for me it's the realism like for as somebody who's been in that situation and been in that life and no I know people like that to me that's 
what world building is for urban fantasy. It's about making it feel actually like urban, like an urban world, like a real world that I can sink into that is concrete and brings the readers to like to my reality, like to that world. And maybe while they're there, they get to learn that not everything about crime is so black and white. But that's that's the difficult part for me is making all of that feel real. I wish I had my lighter. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to go <laughs> just go back and forth like this. I was like, speak, preach. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> the reality of urban <laughs> fantasy. Let's. Yeah, I think kind of similar to Matu, um, the realism factor is really important to me. Um, I find I can be a little bit critical of urban fantasy when the magic feels too outlandish or things just feel too weird to be believable because we're, we're in our real world, right? But we're adding in all of these other elements. And so if those elements don't feel realistic or believable to me, it takes me out of the world. And so that's the most important thing and the most difficult thing for me is finding that balance between mm -hmm. enough fantasy that it's in urban fantasy, but not so much that it's gonna pull the reader out of the world. Mm -hmm. Very good. I love that. I did get my mic working. <laughs> Absolutely, you were, you're, you're my last <laughs> index card. Um, so I'm definitely one of those people where the city is like a character, especially my first series, which is probably the truest urban fantasy that I've written. And I wrote that while I was living in Montreal for an internship. I'm from a small town in Ohio. So it was such a culture shock. And I worked in a lot of just like normal Montreal things, like walking into a room and realizing everyone else is speaking French and you are not fluent or trying to find parking in certain areas of town, it, you know, um, running from the bad guy in a really crowded mall, you know, stuff like that, that I really loved working in. And it was just so different from what I was used to that it really made it a lot of fun to write. That's a very good point, especially if I, I always wonder, especially for for people who didn't grow up in the city, it's like when you move to the city, it's even in the real world, it's almost like this like magical place, even though it might not be good magic, not like, but like it's like this magical place and the 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 elements that you in the inspirations that you can draw from all the places around you and use all of these like new locations to you know construct your own you know urban fantasy that's just so cool thank you sophia next question what's an element writers should consider during the world building stage for their urban fantasy Lex, you first. Sure. Um, I think for me, um, I kind of do world building on the go. So I might not fully know what this world is going to look like when I first start. It kind of unfolds as I write. Um, so for me, understanding who my characters are and how they fit into that world and what they're going to show me about that world is really important. Like how does each individual person fit in not just to the plot of the story but to this landscape that you're creating facts love that okay yeah so um maybe a, a question during the world building maybe in your edits but something i feel really should uh, should be integrated there is your character perspective. So harder, of course, like a lot of things are if you have a large cast with multiple viewpoints, um, but a setting is not just what it is. It's how your characters feel about it, interact with it. And so um, that can go on a scale from, you know, just their mood in the way that they're describing things up to crafting a world for your story that reflects character. So I, uh, I had a certain character I wanted to write in my first series and I added things 
you know, specifically to that city, to that world building, to try to explain how that person became how they are. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can really kind of get into it. And then in the third book in that series, the character actually has the powers to sort of craft the world around them. So you get to a whole other level where it's not just uh, sort of implied that their mood, you know, makes the room darker, but they're literally just popping things out of thin air, you know, to express their anger or, or whatever. So yeah, have fun with it, but don't forget that it's all from a certain perspective. It's not, it isn't just, you know, fact standing in isolation. I love that. I absolutely agree with you to bounce off of that. I also think I, and as an, you know, an urban fantasy where I myself, I also think that it's very important for you to understand where your character in this landscape of the city actually stands um, like class wise, right? Like, are they lower class? Are they middle class? Are they upper class? Because a lot of people, you know, think that, um, you know, urban is supposed to represent like all lower class, but no, it's like a mixture of stuff. Is your character, are they from the hood over here? Or did they just move into like a gentrified neighborhood over here? Or are they on the top floor of some type of ritzy hotel that's been around since the 1700s and, you know, they snort fairy dust. Like <laughs> there's a lot of different, you know, it's definitely important to consider like, even if you're, even if like class wise, that's like class isn't important in your story in order to make sure that you are realistic um, and balancing that realism with the fantastical elements it you know when you're in an urban setting like class is everything even if it isn't everything you know so I'm just going sorry I know I'm not a panelist I apologize Sophia so one mistake that I think I made when I was working on one of the early drafts of the spider's web is I set it too firmly in a specific time frame and this is something that can happen no matter what genre you're, you're writing, but I got so caught up in writing the city as I was seeing it that I included a lot of things that were going to change in six months. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, trying not to hold that realism too firmly to account, like let the city breathe, allow it to change, you know, recognize that there's going to be be differences and um, allow that to happen because I'm not someone who can write high fantasy. I cannot build those worlds from scratch. So I went to the far opposite end of the spectrum and was trying to write hyper-realistic and it did not work. Don't do that. <laughs> That's a very good point. I absolutely agree. It's very important to let the city breathe, especially if you don't live in that city to begin with. You don't want to go down the, you know, Google map hole where you are you on a street on such and such lane and such and such intersection. And you're, you know, like going like one foot at a time, like, oh, there's a Starbucks on that corner. Let me include that. Oh, you know, there's a grocery store on that corner. Oh, let me include that. Yeah, let it, let it breathe. <laughs> most definitely let it breathe it's okay to to, to fictionalize it a little bit yeah <laughs> my two so I think that there's a couple of things um like what Sophie touched on I agree um also don't be afraid to just make up a location that doesn't actually exist because remember you have that the, the disbelief from it being fantasy so like if that tea shop doesn't exist it doesn't exist it doesn't matter uh it, you're working in an alternate universe almost and I think it's okay to remember that um on the note that you picked up Bethany because that's what I was thinking of almost a hundred percent the moment you the question was presented was classism um and isms in general uh what I think a lot of people, uh, so a lot of urban fantasy is set in the United States, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that 
especially in the United States, cities are very large mixing pots because that's where the majority of your jobs are. And because that's the majority where your jobs are, you have more of a collection of diversity. And I think that a lot of urban fantasy fails in this category. Uh, They don't consider classism. They don't consider racism and how that impacts the city at large. And I think that when you're doing your world building, looking into books about redlining, looking into books about how classism and gentrification work, is integral to getting a better understanding of creating your own world like uh just a side note like the um what is the name of the park in new york uh central the the square garden i think Uh, garden oh madison square garden are you talking about washington square park oh uh no definitely madison i believe um the large park that's there was built over a black neighborhood uh, so that's Central Park. Mm-hmm. Central Park, thank you, uh, was built over a Black neighborhood. And these are things that I think are really important to remember when you're building a world that a lot of our own real world comes from things that aren't that pretty to look at. And um, like a good example, urban fantasy, if anybody's seen the originals, uh, which is on Netflix still I think Uh, it's a vampire show um, predates I think uh, Vampire Academy and all that Um, there's a former enslaved man who becomes a vampire and he realizes that the other vampires that he's supposed to be friends with that are supposed to be part of his like little coven um, are staying at the plantation where he was enslaved and it's a entire point in the show and to me, that's more grounding for world building than anything else. That's a very good point. Very, very good point. A lot of people forget. And it's almost like sometimes you wonder if people are, if people don't write those types of things because um, they're afraid of it getting too quote unquote political Mm. or is it because they didn't put research into it because they think it's urban fantasy no research is required and uh, yeah I mean and maybe it's because my because I come from multiple marginalized backgrounds being biracial being queer being disabled and stuff like I know how the world affects me personally um you know like people look at my name on a resume and go "Mm, can't pronounce that and yeet it into the trash so Mm -hmm. for me I I understand like the more inner workings like I know you do Bethany Mm -hmm. um and how that affects us as uh people who are not non-white essentially Mm -hmm. uh especially ethnically and racially and um I just think that if you're going to build an urban world it fantasy or not it has to in some ways reflect those isms that are huge and important and what have built our world as it is like there are entire like like the park like the there's tons of lakes that were built on top of black communities and there are tons of places that they completely removed entire native american burial grounds to build hotels and shit and I think if you're not considering these things in your story I'm not saying that you have to be like and here's the history of this street but you know it's something to make sure that you're un- have a, an understanding of when you're building those characters in those areas absolutely you made like note for note point for point absolutely um I think we have time for just one more question before it's time for um, the audience questions. So don't forget, get your questions in there. Um, What is a writer misconception you often see about urban fantasy or world building? But to be 100% honest, now I think about it, a lot of you already answered that question in your answers. So I'm just gonna change it to this. What are the ethics 
writers. Actually, we just answered that question too. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Is there, <laughs> is there a particular urban fantasy novel you'd recommend that you believe is a master class in world building? If so, what do you admire most about it? Okay. Um, Sophia? I knew you were going to ask me first and and it's one of those where I have now forgotten every book I've ever read. <laughs> it's okay. To, it's okay if if you don't, you know, have yeah. A um, <laughs> I really love the Chicagoland vampire series. Yeah. Um, I also really love the Urban Shaman series, but I have a feeling that if I went back and read it now, that it would not have aged well. Um. And then there's another series that I'm, oh, uh, I can picture the covers, cannot think of the author or the title. It was the uh, werewolf radio host. And no one knows what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, was her name Kitty? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I know the name. <laughs> I mean, I know the, the, the book you're talking about but it escaped me that's a very very early urban yeah. fantasy book when there was a big urban fantasy boom in the early 2000s yeah yeah I, will... I, I apologize I've been in a reading slump for about two years so I haven't read anything recent <laughs> I need to remember. and I just keep going back to the older stuff that I really enjoyed yeah uh I, I will think about that uh that's gonna bug me I'll remember the name to that um see matu uh so for me i'm gonna have to probably go with i want to say ninth house and um because it connects the city and the college city so well which i found really really interesting but it also like because there's a lot of flashbacks in ninth house we get that gritty nitty drug underbelly of the world and how fantasy leads the main character to drugs and then we get her trying to recover of that and then we get the frat boy world from you know the upper class um assholes at the college and it is a clash of literal classism and the, it is just really, really well constructed. I know a lot of people didn't like it because it's kind of slow paced, but I like slow paced books. So uh, that's me. But uh, for other stuff, um, I don't really think I consider uh, a lot of stuff. It, it kind of rides that like belt because some things are not actually urban fantasy, but somebody might think they are because they're contemporary fantasy. Uh, and that gets confused a lot. And I see that as an issue a lot, especially with Black authors who will write this book in the Midwest and people will be like, it's urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is set in Iowa. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so, but so like overall, I, it's kind of hard to really like nail down because a lot of the books that I really love aren't actually set in cities and stuff. They're more contemporary dark fantasies. Um, but at yeah, Ninth House is the world building is masterful, and um, I mean, uh, Bardugo is good at world building in general. Um, even, even if um, Shadow and Bone series was just completely ripped off an entire culture, but you know, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> right. The Ninth House book is dead. It's really dead. It is. A, it is a pretty. Um, she was very detailed very deep detail mm -hmm. it was amazing but also she, if for those that haven't read it she what she does is um at the beginning and ending of each chapter she includes excerpts from journals and she includes excerpts from um magic based manuals so that people understand the history um of the you know like sorority frat houses that are in this community and mm -hmm. so she doesn't overload people with like the intensity of the world building and she just kind of like sums everything up in like these little snippets and excerpts that just kind of like give you like a, a layer a thick layer 
of world building. Lex? Uh, so like Sophia, I'm kind of having one of those, I cannot remember any book that I've ever read <laughs> moments. Um, but I will say one of my favorite like niches of urban fantasy is that like hidden world aspect. Mm -hmm. And the thing that got me into that was Buffy the Vampire Slayer growing up. And I think that there's something to be said about how the characters that are not involved in everything that Buffy and the Scoobies are doing um, still kind of understand that there's something different about Sunnydale and there's something different about the world that they live in. Um, and I really like that aspect of world building. Of course, whenever we're looking at something like Buffy from a 2022 lens, it's really important to always remember the missteps and the mistakes and the really, really blatant, horrible things that these writers and creatives did um, and the things that were not so great. Um, but I think overall, there's a reason that stories like that last so long. And it's because yes, you could just be like, oh, it's just this quirky, really weird story about a girl and some vampires. But if you really dissect the episodes and the seasons, you have this very intense world happening right in front of ordinary people who have no idea that vampires are even real. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I almost wish that I had put urban fantasy novel or, or like a form of media because like there are some really good examples of world building from some TV shows and some movies that like definitely deserve like their coin, like their flowers. So absolutely. Kay. Yeah, so I appreciate going last on this because it gave me time to Google some names real quick. Um, <laughs> pencils down. Pencils down. Yeah, I, I did my research. I'm moving on. Um, I am coloring outside the lines because I kind of do that. And I, um, I don't mind it. Like, I don't necessarily love the really gritty realism of some urban fantasy. And I appreciate that others do. And that's fantastic for them. Um, but I'll, you know, write across boundaries. So if you want some sort of classic recommendations, Patricia Briggs, um, Kelly Armstrong, they do fantastic, entertaining, uh, you know, really balanced urban fantasy. But I want to get weirder than that. So I really love that. Go, uh, Lilith St. Crow is, is a favorite author, really kind of off kilter way of approaching pretty much everything. And her series Trailer Park Fae is stretching it a bit because it's a trailer park. It's kind of like urban, but on the fringes maybe, um, just has like amazing vibes, amazing vibes. I want to write something like it one day, it's great. And uh, stretching things in the other direction, this technically should be allowed because it feels like second world fantasy, but spoiler alert, if you read far enough, it eventually comes back to earth. Um, and it's in translation, the Mirror Visitor series uh, starts with, I think, A Winter's Promise by Christelle Davos, and it's translated from French. And it just has the most stunning world building that kind of starts at this personal immediate scale with a sentient scarf and its kind of weirdo owner and explodes into this like incredible universe, this whole world that um, is so different than our own and yet kind of comes back to it in really interesting ways. And it deals with uh, these questions about class and politics and, um, and the really the longest slow burn romance you have ever read. So mm -hmm. definitely check that out. Um, it's getting a little bit into second world fantasy almost by the vibe, but I love it. I think it's amazing. And it truly is an absolute masterclass in world building. Absolutely. Thank you. I know, like for me, um, if I had to pick a, um, yes, Lucifer is an excellent urban fantasy. Um, if I had to pick an urban fantasy, now granted, it's not a book, but like, even though people hate it, I love um, Netflix's Bright. Um, I feel like that world, like it's, it has like Will Smith in it and it's like set in, um, LA and you have like fairies and you have orgs and everyone is segregated and you have elves over here and it's like in one movie it gives you 
so much intricate world building. Now, granted, they have like a visual medium, but it's just like, I liked the grittiness of everything. And it also kept that classism in place because you had like the elves, they're like the top of the bunch. And then you have the orgs, they're like at the very bottom. And then you had like these little tooth fairies that like people just really didn't care about. And they were beating the hell out of them with brooms. Like it was just like, a re- it's just like a really good movie, um, I think. But um, yeah, let's talk about, I think, yeah, I think we've got, let's see, let, let's get into uh, questions from the audience now. Oops. So questions from the audience, starting from the top. Does your, does Diana ask, does your urban fantasy involve fantasy creatures or just humans with the magic system? It's a very good question. Love that. Thank you. Let me mix this up. Lex? Um, so a little bit of a mix. It depends on the story. Um, and as far as fantasy creatures go, mostly they're like cryptids or really weird sort of things like that, not your traditional. I, I don't really work a lot with fae or things like that. Um, I, I prefer to sort of keep my creatures in the shadows um, and make it kind of feel like, oh, it could be a dog, but it's probably not. And uh, different fun things like that. Um, But really it depends on the story itself and which world, what elements of the world I'm trying to bring in through those creatures or humans. Thank you. Matu? Uh, So it depends on the story for me. And I think that story is integral for everything. If it's going to impact the characters or not. Um, For the book that I'm on submission for right now, um, there are uh, non-human creatures. And um, however, while they're similar to Fae, they actually come from my own culture. Uh, I'm an Ishinabe and uh, they're Ojibwe uh, creatures. They're considered like the little people, uh, but I've kind of changed them up a little bit and gave them some more of a fantasy fantasy spin. Um, and it works in that context. Uh, for some of my other books though, I've got the whole elves, fawn, satyrs, your mix of uh, different th- things. And I play on how that works in the culture. And I really, really, really love playing on how it impacts biracial people because for obvious reasons. Um, And so for me, it's like, you know, if you have somebody who's a half fawn and stuff like that, um, those are things that like in, uh, you almost never see in video games and stuff is your biracial characters. And um, I find that that's more where I lean towards things is how once we're all connected, we're going to, we're gonna, we're gonna breed like humans like sex and so do these other creatures according to lore so here we are (laughs) absolutely that's a very good point about um biracial characters it's but and though it yeah very very important sophia so in my published work (laughs) i have mostly worked with just like magic systems or it's usually witches and ghosts like that's my jam um I do have a couple pieces that have not been published yet that involve things like cryptids vampires werewolves that kind of thing um which if you want to read you need to follow my patreon because that's where I post the unpublished stuff <laughs> shameless plug okay yeah plug it babe okay yeah, so uh, absolutely. I'm not super comfortable writing well-known fantasy creatures. So no vampires um, or werewolves so far anyways. I tend to, this is where horror kind of leaks in. I get into the dark fantasy zone. So lots of monsters, lots of sort of menacing creatures um, further off the beaten path. And even the humans, it's like, are they human really? They have magic, they maybe get there, but so for sure. 
Uh, I would say urban fantasy doesn't have to have fantasy creatures if, if that's why the question is coming up, uh, but it definitely can and you can go wild or you can go really classic and have your, you know, vampires, fairies, werewolves and ghosts. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Urban fantasy can either have humans with magic or it could have it could have fantasy creatures either or works there's and that's the thing about urban fantasy is that it kind of has no limits as long as it's in a city setting you know so that's that's very important to consider another good question from nikki is when you construct your story bible what do you start with and how do you construct it? Uh, yeah, so people. Um, cities don't exist without people, uh, period. And how cities function. So I also do a little bit of cartography and stuff like that uh, since I'm an artist full time. Um, but when a city is formed, it doesn't form in a structure, like city planning is not done in a structure that says, oh, this is what seems the best. It's what is the right thing for the people that live within this area. And so uh, like your, your cities and stuff, we, the reason like medieval towns were all structured so closely knit together was because that's how they were built for the people and so I don't start anything until I know what the class system the people uh like marginalizations and everything and how those are impacting the that world and once I have a better idea of what my characters and the people living in the city are going to be like then I get into my world building uh structuring it I just I start from the top and I do magic last and then I um edit where things might need to be edited, like always lean in the, the direction of this would be really badass. I like that progression. Yeah, always start from the, from the top down, absolutely. Kay? Yeah, so um, this is where I confess, I don't really keep a formal story Bible and I'm not that organized. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm also really, really bad at point form. I'm one of those writers that wants all the words all the time. So I have Apple Notes is full of little bits and pieces, and they're really hard for me to look up again. Uh, in terms of character <laughs> information, like at one point I started copying and pasting from my drafts so that I'd know how old they were and like how I described them and, and all that. Uh, their backstories I wrote as like mini stories and actually published some of those as short stories later because I cannot just like write a list of facts about my character. I have to find it out through a story. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I do recommend is sitting down at some point and it can be near the end and just like writing out when stuff happens so that you don't have like a week's worth of stuff going on in the span of a single day, because mm -hmm. I did. Um, and sometimes you wanna say like, oh, and then two weeks later this happened and you're like, oh, hang on, everything happened in 48 hours. And that is not possible, so yeah. Take notes uh, if you like being organized. I do like spreadsheets. I just don't use them for stories and I don't have any software recommendations. Just be chaotic, why not? I actually have a software recommendation and this is coming from someone that is a pantser. I actually, I actually world build before I plot. <laughs> like I have, to, I have to know the world so I know how the characters fit in the world, what they want, their desires, their obstacles. And then I plot, plotting is the, like, if it's even a plot, it's more like vibes and feelings and I just wander around in the dark. But Scrivener, now granted, like I'm not a Scrivener fan for like writing it and like writing stories in it, but it is the best story Bible because you have folders and you can do research and you can put links and you can upload like um, PDFs and it also has a search feature. So like, you know, like you have your diction, your, your, your dictionary, your terms, like literally it's the best. And it's also great for timelines and it's just like, great for organizing everything. I can't recommend it for writing in it because I don't write in it, but 
I've learned to love it as a pantser that world builds the heck out of everything. Um, like I love Scribner. Okay, Sophia. So I usually start with a timeline just so I can get like all the events in order. And one thing that I started doing because I have two different short story series that I'm working on is I write down what order the story is in the series, the title, and then what I call the micro plot, which is the plot of the individual story, and then the macro plot, which is how it impacts the overall story arc of the series. Um, but I have a whole bunch of different like worksheets that I have set up for plotting and organizing information and everything. So again, shameless plug, check out my website. <laughs> okay, Lex. Um, so I typically don't start, if I do a story Bible, I don't start it until the first draft is done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's typically just because like Bethany, I am also very much a pantser. Um, I plan some kind of skeleton of how the story is gonna unfold or the important beats, write that on index cards so that I can move them around for myself. Um, and I will plug Scrivener for that um, because it does allow you to do that digitally. Um, and then I will typically, once I have that first draft, I list out all the characters and start there um, because typically they're, they're the ones that are telling me this story. So when I'm doing the Bible, they're the ones that are gonna kind of lead me to, okay, what's really important as I'm moving into this next phase of drafting. Very good point. And also to plug Scrivener, um, Scrivener has a settings feature. So you can put pictures of your settings. You can put all the information you need about your setting. They also have, um, they also have templates for characters and they also come on index cards so you can move stuff around. You can make the pictures big, you can make the pictures small. Like, like Scrivener is the best for like world building Bibles. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Okay, plug done. Um, <laughs> next question is, let me curl up because I like this question a lot. Um, Christy says, thoughts and opinions about footnotes and headers being used to help with world building. So, um, okay. Yeah, I, I say go for it. Um, you're gonna have a little bit more work to do on the formatting end. If you're indie, you'll have to figure that out. If you're not, someone else's problem, so that's cool. Um, I've seen them used to great effect. I personally enjoy them. Uh, the Bartimaeus trilogy, I think by Jonathan Stroud, uses them and it adds so much humor. It's brilliant. Um, I really need to reread those. Secondary, actually that might be an urban fantasy. So my only caveat there is make sure it fits your vibes. Like make sure it's still in service of your story. So don't just do it because you want to dump more facts at readers, unless you think that, you know, that's the readership you want to connect with. That's you do you. But you can, you can be really serious with it and add this kind of sense of mysticism. You can deepen your world. You can add humor, um, just like the rest of your story. You know, think about perspective, character. What is this in service of? But yeah, sure, why not? Thank you. Lex? Um, so I'll be totally honest. I come from a legal background. Um, and so I am very, very used to footnotes and headers being used in that aspect. And so I don't love them when I am just reading for fun and not reading for information. Um, if it helps, I will sometimes plug them in there for myself as author's notes, but I typically take them out of the final draft. Um, but like Kay said, if it's something that fits the vibe of your story and that you like doing and that you think your audience is going to get something out of, then by all means do it because it can absolutely, I've seen books where it works really, really well. It adds some humor, it adds some additional context that can help the reader really place themselves. Um, just personally, it's not for me or my work. Sophia, thank you. So I don't do them in my fiction. I do also write nonfiction and I will use them there. Um, I do have one example where it was done well. Unfortunately, pretty sure the book is out of print. 
Um, it's called The Curse on the Mountain by Missouri Dalton. And it's a high fantasy book that is narrated from the perspective of this like historian uh, naturalist type of person who's studying this city that has a really unique uh, ecology and weather patterns. And so he has inserted footnotes into it. And then there's footnotes replying to the footnotes where his editor is like, you can't say that. You can't put that in the book. <laughs> Matu? Uh, so just bouncing off of Sophia a little bit there. Um, I, I think Terry Pratchett, uh, Pratchett was one of the main writers who did a lot of uh, an overarching narrator as the voice rather than a main character. And I think in that context, footnotes and stuff make sense. And I think they're funny and they work. Um, in Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, um, the first one, there is journal entries at the top of every chapter, which I felt worked really well because they give you kind of this taste of uh, the antagonist throughout the story, which I really enjoyed. Um, however, overall, I don't read them. I am a lazy reader and I skip them. <laughs> Unless I feel like it's gonna it, like really draw me more into the story, like the journal entries I did read. Uh, but overall, I don't read them. I'm like, aha, uh -huh, that's nice. And I continue on. <laughs> you know, I have to admit, um, for for my uh, YA novel that I'm writing, it does have like excerpts like at the top that's from like Wikipedia, but it's Witcherpedia because oh, it's like that. little things that, you know, that explain the world. And then another thing is in if you want to use like footnotes or headers to um, help with your world building, and you notice that maybe and you're trying to query and you realize that that's not working, it might be best to convert that into another form of media. So for instance, like a transcript of a, conver of a phone conversation, if it's applicable, or a police report of something that happened, if it's applicable. Um, so like, consider other things that make it more interactive and engaging so that mm -hmm. the so that the reader finds out the world building that you want to um, introduce them in a more realistic natural setting especially yeah. if it's if it's urban fantasy like you know my I don't my um my YA witch book um there are characters that are getting arrested so I have a I have a police report that says mm -hmm. yeah the they set somebody on fire. Sorry, dog. Um, <laughs> like, you know, and then there's a transcript of like a, like a nosy white lady that's trying to like <laughs> bust a witcher party that's not supposed to be happening. And, you know, it's like, but you learn a lot of information from the transcripts and the police reports and emails from, you know, emails and text messages from characters to characters or like minor characters to other minor characters if you're trying to flesh out the world like in, if if you want to make it like less academic use other form and also it depends on like who your audience is like if you're writing YA then most definitely you know consider things like text messages and emails and things like that to like convey information mm -hmm. but not like you know actually spoon feed it to them more like you know like lace it with yeah. something I don't maybe lace isn't the right word uh, layering in your exposition is a yeah. much better way of doing it than uh footnotes because you are going to come across lazy readers like me um, <laughs> and um I think that if it doesn't have anything to do with the, the plot story characters you can just leave it out. Don't yeah. info dump. Yeah. Don't put in stuff that is going to go absolutely nowhere. Uh, uh. <laughs> and you can save those little things for like your Patreon or your website. Mm -hmm. If you really want to share it with readers that would be interested, but it yep. just might not be for the general audience. Yep. Agreed. 
definitely depending yeah. on your characters and your plot you know don't add something unless it's absolutely vital because you if you are doing traditional public you might get an agent that's like what is this and why mm -hmm. so we have one last question and this is a really good question and it's how do you make a city into a character in the story so that's a very good question thank you diana just coming through with the fire um let's start with sophia okay so for me that setting really does become a character just because i'm not good at world building and i realized that having a sense of place is super important in my writing so it really depends on the book how it becomes a character but I'll stick with the spider's web since that's the urban fantasy book I've been talking about most um just like using a lot of places within the city that are recognizable was one thing I did like at some point she goes up on Mount Royal and there's a thing there called Tam Tams and it's a it started out as just like a drum circle in the 70s and now it's got like a marketplace there's a dj there are these larpers who go up there and have sword fights and that is how she gets her first self-defense training is she's taking part in these larp fights with foam swords <laughs> and trying to figure out how do i defend myself from an attacker and there's other things like she has to go fight a monster in an area that's got really shitty parking. So she has to take a bus to go save the world, you know, <laughs> um, just like little things like that, that someone who isn't from the area might not consider. Um, and I was really lucky in that I was living there at the time. So I was able to see these things and work them in. And now I try and use mostly cities that I've been to in my writing. Um, but in other books, if I'm writing like a generic town, it's usually a small town because I'm from a small town. So using that kind of culture as well. Um, like everybody knows everybody and like, oh, hey, we have this weird little tradition in this small town where we have a boat parade every year um, and working those in as well and making them part of the story. Thank you. So we're actually down to the last three minutes. So instead of calling you guys out and bullying you by name, I'm just going to give you an opportunity. Does anyone want to answer this question before we um, end the panel? Uh, I'd love to. Um, I think that it's really important to uh, acknowledge that atmosphere plays a major role in making a character out of um, a city. And when I say atmosphere, I mean your five senses. So that can involve uh, the weather. Is the weather uh, like, because if you live in Louisiana and it's the dead, it's middle of summer and you're telling me that it's just a nice pretty day out and it's not muggy as fuck I don't believe you um I just I don't <laughs> like I, I know what the south is like okay <laughs> but um are there rats going down the alleyway are there people screaming um if you're going down an alleyway and it's behind a restaurant can you hear the dishwasher loading the di uh dishwasher you know what I mean like these are parts of the city that are going to be actively creating a character around you. If um, your characters are always going through things and doing things without anything stopping them or anyone noticing them, are they really in a city? Because unless they're in New York and they're all wearing fursuits and the New Yorkers are like, eh. Um, I just, you, it has to be believable. Uh, so atmosphere what is it what's the weather like what do I hear what do I see what do I smell what what can I taste and um all of that has to like because you can taste the air in parts of my city like you can taste that air um but if I'm down in Bricktown it's loud it's loud there and um if I'm gonna try and get away with something I'm gonna be in the loudest part of town so right I'm trying not to be heard. 
I want everybody to be yelling. So Very that's that's the kind of stuff that um, letting your characters engage with the way the city operates. I'd also love to jump into and say that a really good question to ask if you want to be, um, if you want the city to be a character in your story is, can this story take place anywhere else? Because if the answer is yes, then your city is not a character. If the answer is no, you've inserted enough into your city and made your city an important enough place to feel like a character to the reader. Absolutely. Very good point. I wish we could go on, y'all. This, this was a really good conversation. I actually made a mistake oh, for Sophia's handle. It's not as in K-N-O-T magic with the K at the end. Um, so I apologize for that. But we are at the end. Thank you so much to our panelists that came. Thank you to everyone um, that came. This video is a recording of a panel from the event Story Crafting Sessions Fantasy, a free one-day virtual conference hosted by the Weeknight Writers Group in partnership with Renaissance Press. To learn more about the Weeknight Writers Group, you can go to businessforauthors.com slash weeknight dash writers. And to learn more about Renaissance Press, you can go to pressesrenaissancepress.ca.